A week of hope about inflation and interest rates, about China's relations with the United States, about Britain getting serious about its budget, and, of course, former President Trump's hope that he can do it all again. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on what came out of the G20 meetings in Bali. And former Fed Vice Chair Rich Clarida on the liquidity problem in the Treasuries market and what can be done about it. It was a week of hoping, hoping that things just might start to move in a better direction in U.S.-China relations after President Biden's meeting in Bali with President Xi. I absolutely believe there need not be a new Cold War. I do not think there's any imminent attempt on the part of China to invade Taiwan. And I uh, made it clear that our policy in Taiwan has not changed at all. Hoping that inflation may just be easing a bit in the United States, with Fed Vice Chair Leo Brainerd telling Bloomberg we might see a bit of moderation in rate hikes. I think it will probably um, be appropriate to move to a slower pace of increases. But I think what's really important to emphasize, we've done a lot. But we have additional work to do both on raising rates and sustaining restraint to bring inflation down. Hoping that the new British government has gotten the message as it put forth a new budget designed to reassure the markets. So today we deliver a plan to tackle the cost of living crisis and rebuild our economy. Yeah. Our priorities are stability, growth and public services. And then, of course, there's that special kind of hope that former President Trump brings to everything he does, deciding that despite what happened in the midterms to his hand-picked candidates, this was the right time to announce he's running again for president. In order to make America great and glorious again, I am tonight announcing my candidacy for president of the United States. Even as prominent investor and Republican supporter Ken Griffin of Citadel couldn't find much to hope for in Mr. Trump's candidacy. He lost in 2020. We lost Georgia because of his behavior in the Senate race in 2020. That's a second loss. And then this year, the Republicans lost the Senate because the Trump-backed candidates in the Senate races were rejected by American voters. That's a three-time loser. And I'd like to think that the Republican Party is ready to move on from somebody who's been, for this party, a three-time loser. But whatever we were all hoping for this week, we didn't really get that much out of the markets, which traded without real conviction, with the S&P 500 off just seven-tenths of a percent for the week, and the Nasdaq down 1.57 percent, and the yield on the 10-year up about seven basis points, ending the week at 3.82. To help us sort it all out, we welcome now Afsani Beshla, CEO of Rock Creek, and Bob Michael. He's chief investment officer and head of the Global Fixed Income Unit at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. So welcome, both of you. Great to have you back. Bob, let me start with you. I mean, I watched the eco numbers. I listened to the Fed speak. I sort of felt like I was going both ways at the same time. What did you see? Well, for a bond investor, all of us who have been battered this year, this is one of the weeks that made sense to us. Mm. We had a nice tailwind coming in from the inflation data. It was great all the way through core. When you look at shelter, everything. Yes, the markets went a little crazy. They went wild. And the central bankers did what they're supposed to do. They came in one by one and reminded us don't declare victory yet. These are only a couple prints. There are more hikes to come, but maybe there is some optimism. And the market settled down. So I look at this week and I thought, this is the first great week in a long time. So, Sonny, is that the way you saw it as well? And uh, there's still some more rate hikes to come. How many? I think at least uh, another three to start with, 50 basis points uh, next time in December, followed by at least two or three 25 basis points uh, next year. And then we'll see from there. Uh, and I think what uh, Bob said is very true at the same time as we were listening to at least three Fed people come and speak. I wrote down, I think they all had very different quotes. Uh, and you had some of that when Leo Bernard talked. Uh, but you also had uh, uh, the president of St. Louis Fed say something slightly different as if, you know, we would start, we would continue uh, with rate increases for a while longer than she had implied. And then, of course, we had Susan Collins come in today 
uh, with um, even, you know, sort of potential 75 basis points. So we're hearing numbers that are a little bit all over the place and trying to make sense of it. So, so Bob, are the markets making it harder for the Fed as a practical matter? Um, they were at the start of the week. I think not so much now. I think we're all in the same spot. We've all got realistic expectations. The Fed's headed to four and a half, five percent. They'll get there sometime in the first quarter. We'll see where inflation is if it's below the Fed funds rate. Then that gives them some scope to pause on the tightening. We can reevaluate at that point. But right now, bond yields have gone up a long way in a very short period of time. It's time for a breath. Bob, does that get us to a soft landing? Uh, unfortunately, it does not. <laughs> and I think that's the one consistent message from the Fed. Susan Collins aside, which is there is going to be pain for businesses and households. When you have this magnitude of rate hikes in such a short period, and you're also withdrawing liquidity through quantitative tightening, it's going to bite. And we're already seeing it's biting the economy hard. Thankfully, it's also now starting to bite inflation. So I want to pick up on the liquidity just for a moment, if I could, Afsani. How big a problem do we have in the Treasury market now with the liquidity? I hear conflicting things, but some people are very concerned about it. Big problems. I think Bob lives it much more than I do. Uh, but uh, as, uh, as you know, there are very, very uh, big problems with the trading volumes. And, um, and for big traders or even small traders, uh, getting a uh, bit is becoming much harder and you're working in a much less liquid uh, liquid environment. And I know between Treasury and the banks, there have been a lot of meetings, but I'm not so sure if we have a solution yet. Well, Bob, could the Fed make it easier with some regulatory cha changes? Um, it, it could. But I think the moaning that we hear in the bond market about liquidity, it's always there. We always mm -hmm. complain. We don't get the price we want. The reality is, for the last couple of weeks, you could have moved your portfolio in any direction you wanted, up and down duration, up and down credit risk, without any kind of penalty. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that big a believer in the lack of liquidity. I'm sorry, when we talk about a soft landing, uh, it brings me back to oil, because oil did move this week, and it moved down in the price of oil. And most people I talked to suggested it was in part because of a, a concern about global recession, really a backing off or at least a softening in the markets. You came out of that business. You really know energy backwards and forwards. What are we seeing in oil? So, as you said, uh, oil prices did, the future numbers went down below 80, which was a big shift from a little while ago. But um, my view is still that we might just avoid a recession in the U.S. if we're fortunate, uh, but we may not be able to avoid it in Europe and the rest of the world. And a lot of the, I think, softness for these numbers that we saw today and in recent days is because of the expectations in China. Now, China is starting to open up a little bit, maybe, and, uh, and loosen its COVID rules. But that's going to take a while, and I think that softening is uh, is uh, softening the uh, oil markets, and will probably do continue to do that. Is it opening up? I mean, I I'm not exactly sure of exactly what's happening because, on the one hand, we hear them saying things that sound a little softer on zero COVID. On the other hand, we hear about a lot of cases. So it is. I have, I, it was kind of interesting. We had a team out uh, in Asia as uh, this week. And they came back with interesting news that there is actually some physical opening up. But now you have people who are afraid to go out because they've been told so long that they're, if they go out, they'll get COVID. And so you're seeing a very different phenomenon, which is uh, actual, you know, individuals not wanting to go out of their houses versus the government, which has been very strict about you getting out of your house. I'm sorry, we also had the G20, of course, meeting over in Bali, and some people thought there would be no uh, single statement coming out of it. They did come to some agreement, in part driven by some of the developing countries. Should that be encouraging to investors, actually, that we're getting back perhaps a little toward multilateral cooperation? Uh, much more positive news came out of the G20 than uh, we all expected. And as you said, there was also a lot of a big stress on reform of the multilateral lending because the big news out of that meeting was that there's huge needs when it comes particularly to emerging markets, uh, climate related investments. And there's no way with the existing uh, finances of the multilaterals that that could be met. So uh, that was why there was a lot of emphasis on the reform of the multilateral sector, but also getting the multilaterals to work much better with the private sector to generate uh, more resources. And you saw that very particular case of Indonesia, which was um, discussed a lot and written up a lot 
with about 20 billion going into re to replace coal in Indonesia with uh, cleaner fuels. Bob, another important development this week is sort of a rolling development is the outcomes of the, multi of the midterm elections. We found out that the Democrats will hold on to the Senate. The Republicans will get a narrow majority in the House. What does that communicate, if anything, to investors? Is that sort of a steady-as-you-go way because we have a split government, not much is going to happen either way? So it for sure is. I, I will tell you, going back to the G20, we're actually hearing from clients, large institutional clients, that they're more confident confident about allocating to markets when the G20 countries are talking to one another again and working with one another again. So that's a huge positive. I don't remember that in, gosh, over a decade. Um, when, yeah, when, when you go back to the gridlock in Washington, I hate to say it, but the markets kind of like it. It's when there are dramatic policy changes, you have to reprice everything in the markets. It becomes destabilizing. There are always going to be some winners. There are going to be some losers. This time, if we know we're going to have gridlock, we can focus on bringing inflation down and trying to avoid a recession and have a soft landing. Yeah, I think a lot of people on the street think that it's sort of Hippocratic. First, do no harm. You know, if you're not doing anything, you're at least not messing things up. Bob right. Michael of J.P. Morgan and Afsali Bechlis of Rock Creek will be staying with us as we look at what this week meant for our investment decisions. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. create some of the most valuable companies the market's ever seen. I think it's certainly driven companies like Cisco, given them the life that they've had. It's obviously also spectacularly volatile. The market has pulled back in this sector since it came public, since it began in 1995. It's pulled back 30 to 50 percent at least seven or eight times. That was Henry Blodgett talking about the Internet and tech on Wall Street way back in June of 2000, when the number one movie in the country was Mission Impossible 2, and the most popular song in the country was Maria Maria by Santana. Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan and Afsani Bechlis of Rock Creek are still with us. So, Afsani, certainly Mr. Blodgett was right that we gave us some awfully big and successful companies, no question about it. Some people thought that would happen as well in the crypto space. This week, we're not quite as sure after FTX. What do we make of that? Is that does that have a broader significance in the markets, or is it just a one-off? Um, hopefully, it is more limited. I think there's no question that without regulation, and we've all been talking about having this sector regulated, it would help. Um, it's the market itself, but also the investors going in. Having this particular, com you know, FTX, uh, which is an ex uh, exchange uh, for crypto, uh, be based in the Bahamas with not just uh, no uh, regulation, but also with a uh, few people who had very limited experience in finance or in anything really uh, run it. I think the shocking part of it, David, was that very, very sophisticated venture firms from Sequoia and others who were invested. Uh, it was not just retail getting involved in that market. So it was a surprise, uh, but hopefully it will get limited. And I think it has put a lot of pressure on increasing regulations sooner here. And that will be a good thing for the market. Now, let's not forget that the whole market is less than, you know, a 900 billion. I'm not saying that that's tiny, but it's still not significant enough to create any kind of stress in the market, unless we're missing something that we don't know at this point. I think what's important, David, when you watch that clip, and that was the absolute peak yeah. in, in the dot-com bubble, yes, there was a massive shakeout, there was a massive consolidation, but I would argue the Internet and tech evolved far beyond what any of us ever thought it would be in 2000. I wonder if we're going through the same thing with crypto and NFTs, that it, it got a great start, there is going to be a shakeout, Afsani is right, there's probably going to be a lot of regulation. But when I talk mm -hmm. to the young people mm -hmm. on our desk and our platform, they're still a big believer. And if the millennials are a believer, 22 years from now, they're going to be looking at this clip. <laughs> and I hope we got it right. <laughs> That's fascinating. There is a, there, no question there's a generational issue here. Let's come back to the current generation and people uh, who's as old as I am. I'm older than you are, but as old as I am. What about bonds right now? Do you invest in bonds? Uh, for the first time in a decade, absolutely. And, and 
I, I will tell you that we're seeing interest from everywhere now. Every wealth management platform in JP Morgan, every institutional client, they're coming to us, they're putting money in bonds, they're looking to commit more, and they haven't done so for, for years. If I look at where we got to at the start of the year, a general bond fund, the, the, um, the Bloomberg Ag yielded 1.7%. Now we're up at 4.7%. We have 3% higher yields, and that's going to track investment. And as I said, I think the Fed is close to the end. I don't know if they get to 5%. We're kind of in the four and a half, four and three quarters percent. That's going to bring a lot of stability to the market at these levels. Bonds are back. So, Afsani, you manage a fair amount of money. What about for you? Are bonds attractive at this point, or are you just equities? I think, as uh, Bob said, uh, what is very interesting right now is even in any foundation or endowment or the assets that we manage, uh, you're finding the, exactly the same phenomena where people had moved away from bonds and cash and where all equities and, and uh, private investments moving back into holding uh, bonds. And as we're sort of reaching that uh, 4 or 5 percent that Bob talked about, uh, much uh, more interest in bonds in a more balanced kind of portfolio. And of course, people are looking at cash uh, with 4% uh, at uh, with uh, Treasury bills at the level that is much higher than cash has earned in a very long time. But I think the bigger thing that is happening in the portfolios we're looking at is obviously a lot of uh, investors, institutional investors who've been also investing in venture, private equity, real estate in private form. And I think that is going to some sort of transformation too. Well, let's, let's take a segue, if we could, from that sort of investment into COP27. Uh, as we're speaking right now, it's still going on. It's going to end on Saturday. Right now, Afsani, you know far better than I do. It looks like it's going to be difficult for them to get to the objectives that they had. You're absolutely right. So far, as we know, um, tonight, uh, the latest news was not too positive. Now things could change tomorrow morning, but they didn't really have anything major to announce. Again, as you remember, remember in uh, the tw uh, COP26, they had the GFANS, which was uh, uh, a num large number of large asset managers signing up to make uh, pretty significant shifts in their carbon uh, print. But um, most recently, they started walking back from that or not wanting to sign quite on what they had agreed to in, to, uh, in COP26. So I think it's very, very important as we're having these meetings, maybe they shouldn't be every year, uh, maybe they should be every other year or less often, but show some sort of progress. And the most important part of the discussion this time, David, has been the fact that developing countries, again, have felt that they are in some cases um, uh, suffering because if they're an island economy, they're going underwater. If they uh, are affected by uh, by droughts and by floods, uh, a lot of it might be caused by uh, those who uh, did use a lot of carbon over the last 10, 20 years, and they're asking if they could get help. And that help is really not coming. And I think that uh, is the really uh, major uh, summary of COP27, which is that the expectations of investments um, into climate are probably less than what we expected going into the COP. Well, and just picking up on that, on the investments in it, Bob, I want to come back to you, because one of the things at least I'm taking away from COP27, you can certainly hear, listen to John Kerry, the president's special envoy on this subject. We're not going to get there from public money alone. It's going to take a fair amount of private investment. As a bond person, are there bonds that are green bonds or in the climate area that make sense as a business matter? Um, th there are. I, I think for sure, if you're going to finance something, which is what bond investors do, you want something that has something of a green agenda to it. And we're hearing that from our clients. There's more and more money coming into the space. I think, Afsania, help is on the way <laughs> for the island economies. Uh, the large-scale investors want to com commit capital to this space. Well, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, as it's called, a lot of people object to that title, put a lot of money into the, in the game here on that private side of Sunny. Is it making a difference in the projects that are getting financed? No question. I think, uh, I think the RA is a very powerful act, and it's the largest amount of money going in. And I think that will really mm. help us in the U.S. to invest a lot more in climate-related uh, food and ag, in battery storage, in uh, residential, and in community-related um, solar and wind. So that will be a major, major push. 
and we're seeing, as Bob mentioned, a lot of movement. I agree with him. I think it's just that in COP, where you expected public money to go in, there was a sort of disappointment with that. But the private sector is doing a lot. The young generation is doing a lot. We just need the public sector to uh, jump in when it uh, comes to it outside of the IRA, of course. Bob, last word. Are you seeing a difference in your part of the business in the, for the government tax policy when it comes to green bonds? Um, we are. Are you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's making a real difference, you see it? Um, uh, it is from our perspective. So, yeah, e everything we see that, and, and, you know, we didn't touch on the regulation. There's going to be more regulation poking through what mm. qualifies as a green bond or uh. not. And also, you know, to prevent any greenwashing, either in specific bonds or in bond funds. So watch this space. Yeah, no kidding. It'll be interesting, particularly with the new Congress coming in. Thank you so much. Really great to have both of you with us. This is Afsani Beshlas of Rock Creek and Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan. Coming up, we are going to take a look at next week on Wall Street all around the world. That's here on Bloomberg. I'm David Weston. It's time to look at what's up next week on Global Wall Street, starting with Annabelle Droolers in Hong Kong. Well, thanks, David. This week in Asia, we're going to be taking a close look at two big elections. Now, in Malaysia, voting took place there Saturday, just over a month after Parliament was dissolved for a snap poll. And then meanwhile, Taiwan, that holds midterms this coming weekend. So that's going to be a pulse check on the popularity of the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, as, of course, we see geopolitical tensions continue to rise in the region. Eco-wise, the highlight is on central bank meetings in Korea and New Zealand. And we're going to be live from Seoul for the BOK with expectations there for a half point hike. Plus, the RBNZ predicted to deliver its six straight 50 basis point move. The 2022 World Cup kicks off on Sunday in Qatar. The tournament is being held in the winter for the first time due to the blistering summer temperatures in the region. Thursday sees rate decision by Sweden's Riksbank. Economists forecast a 75 basis point hike, but surging food prices could tip the bank to raise by even more. We'll also on the same day get an account of the ECB's most recent policy meeting. And last, certainly not least, EU energy ministers will be meeting to discuss policy outlook as Europe heads into the winter. A holiday shortened week for the observance of Thanksgiving Day. The main focal point for the week, it will center around the release of the FOMC minutes from that November meeting, a meeting that saw the Fed raise interest rates by 75 basis points for a fourth straight time. Fed Chair Jerome Powell said then that U.S. interest rates would go higher than earlier projected, but several Fed members since have indicated that they may be ready to downshift. A handful of earnings next week to watch, including Zoom Video, Deer, Analog Devices, Best Buy, and Nordstrom. Keep an eye on those last two for a read on the strength of the consumer as the traditional kickoff to the holiday shopping season in the U.S. begins on Friday. The main theme to watch there will be the flight to discounted items by cash-strapped consumers that seem willing to spend, but maybe not have the same capacity as they did a year ago. David? Thanks to Annabelle Droolers, Danny Berger, and Romaine Bostic. Coming up, we saw it happen in the gilt markets. Could a crisis come to the markets for U.S. Treasuries? And would it come from a lack of liquidity? We're going to ask former vice chair of the Fed, Richard Clarida of PIMCO. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We spent a good deal of this week trying to figure out where the Fed is heading on rate increases. And part of what we were watching was the Fed's vice chair, Leo Brainerd, who gave us at least some hope that we might be getting closer to slowing down. I think it will probably um, be appropriate um, uh, soon um, to move to a slower pace of increases. But I think what's really important to emphasize, we've done a lot 
but we have additional work to do both on raising rates and sustaining restraint to bring inflation down. We welcome now Ms. Brainerd's predecessor as vice chair, Richard Clarida, now global economic advisor to PIMCO. So, Richard, thank you so much for being back with us. Good to have you back with us. So do you agree with your successor there? Do you think we're at least approaching a point where we might slow down the pace of increases? David, I do. You know, the Fed has done a lot uh, this year. In fact, it'll be the fastest pace of rate hikes uh, since the early 1980s. Uh, I do anticipate that at the December meeting, they'll They'll, they'll slow the pace from 75 uh, to 50 uh, basis points. Uh, and I think as we move into 2023, I think they think, and I agree, that, that they're close at least to a pause probably in the first half of, of next year. As they said in the November statement, uh, they've done a lot and they want to see how the rate hikes are impacting the economy. So, so Richard, I mean, you have the advantage of having been in the room and having been in the room relatively recently. Give us a sense of what they're looking at their dashboard, because I must say the economic numbers sometimes point in different directions. On the one hand, we do have some indications like the CPI numbers that are maybe slowing down a little bit, the inflation. On the other hand, the overall inflation is still pretty high. It is. And, you know, the challenge the Fed uh, faces and other central banks in the world uh, is uh, that uh, the economy is running hot, and in particular, uh, wages uh, uh, in the economy are growing uh, much faster than consistent with the 2% uh, longer run uh, goal. And so I think that the Fed will be looking at the labor market data. It'll also be looking at inflation expectations. Uh, we have downshifted demand growth. You know, there's an imbalance between demand and supply. And this year, demand growth has already downshifted. So that's an important thing uh, to note. We're certainly along the way to where we need to be. But the Fed has more to do, and we need to get inflation back down towards the 2% objective. So everyone seems to agree there's more for the Fed to be done. We just heard Lael Brandard say exactly that. And the question is, how much more? And, and, and part of the question is, what's the terminal rate? I mean, how far up do we go? We had some somewhat conflicting indications this week, actually. And the banks basically project these things are coming up with very different sorts of answers. Uh, what determines that terminal rate? And let me ask you, perhaps more pointedly, some people think the Fed was a little slow getting off the mark and getting going. Does the slowness of getting started mean the terminal rate would have to be higher necessarily? David, I don't think so. I think what, what, what uh, launching the rate hikes in March did mean, and I think Chair Powell recognized this uh, pretty early on, uh, was that it made sense to get to the destination uh, pretty quickly. And that's why we've had the four successive 75 basis point uh, hikes. Uh, my sense right now is the committee believes, uh, and I share the view, that my baseline view is that I want to get the funds rate around 5%. Uh, percent. If the inflation data comes in uh, on the soft side, maybe four and three quarters. If it comes in on the hot side, maybe five and a quarter. Or perhaps, as President Bullard indicated, maybe north of that. But I think around five percent in the spring will be at a level where they've done a lot. They realize that inflation uh, responds to policy with a lag. Um, and I think that that'll be a good place to, to take stock. So I think that I wouldn't call that necessarily the terminal rate. I hope it is. If the inflation data doesn't improve, then they may have to do more. But I think they will pause at around 5%. So, Richard, I think you just put the finger on the thing that at least perplexes me, which is a two-place function. I mean, you've got what the rates are. You also have what inflation is. And how restrictive that is depends on how far and how fast inflation comes down. So going into the spring, if you're at 5 percent, how far down do you get, need to get inflation before you say, OK, that's restrictive enough? It's an excellent point because um, uh, typically monetary policy op does operate with a lag, so the Fed wants to look ahead. And indeed, uh, for example, Governor Waller and, and others have made reference to comparing the policy rate to where professional forecasters think inflation will be towards the end of, of the year. And I appreciate that point. My own research actually indicates that's a simple thing to do. I think the challenge they face, David, is that, quite frankly, the Fed's record at forecasting inflation uh, has not been very good, including when I was there uh, last year. And so I think it's going to be a balance between adjusting policy according to both the forecast and the incoming data. Richard, it's not just the rates that are going on. We also have so-called quantitative tightening as you try to run down the balance sheet, which had gone so far up. Give us your sense of what that is doing right now to financial conditions in the United States. Well, David, it is tightening conditions. Again, quantitative tightening is, is reversing quantitative easing. So the Fed's balance sheet is shrinking. Now, it's been very well telegraphed. 
Uh, and so markets certainly understand uh, the pace and the modalities of tightening, but it is serving to tighten uh, financial conditions, and that's consistent with what the Fed wants to do in terms of raising rates. So, Richard, that takes us to a subject that I know you've heard a lot about, we read about all the time, which is perhaps a problem with liquidity in the Treasury market. Uh, there's more volatility in the Treasury market, as I understand it, but that's inherent in raising rates. The question is, is there additional volatility because there's not as much liquidity? We hear at least anecdotally that some people are having difficulty uh, buying and selling large lots of Treasuries. Yeah. Well, it's true. I went back and looked. I had the privilege of 20 years ago of serving as Assistant Treasury Secretary in 01 and 02. And in those years, debt outstanding was about $3 trillion, about 30 percent of GDP. This year, it's $23 trillion, or 100 percent of GDP. So quite simply, the amount of debt outstanding and the amount of Treasury issuance is vastly larger than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And the plumbing of the intermediation system for Treasuries has not really expanded uh, concomitantly with that. And so as a result, uh, there is evidence uh, on occasion of illiquidity in the market, certainly in extreme cases, as we observed in March of 2020 or September of 2019, uh, it becomes even more uh, evident. And so I think policymakers at the Fed uh, and the Treasury and other agencies are looking at ways in which Treasury market functioning uh, can be uh, improved. And I think it's certainly something that should uh, be studied and, and improved. And what are possible options if they do conclude there's an issue there? One of them, I suppose, would be reversing and going back to quantitative easing. That's one way to do it. Another might be actually to ameliorating at least some of the restrictions in regulation imposed after the 2008 grand, great financial crisis, which really, as I understood, took a lot of the big banks, uh, limited their participation in the market. Well, it, it's right. And so I think that one of the things, David, that we did uh, in, in, in uh, the spring of 2020 uh, is that we did relax something called the supplementary leverage ratio in the sense that we would not count bank reserves or treasury holdings against that leverage ratio. The idea is we wanted to encourage banks to lend in the pandemic shutdown. Uh, and and the, the Fed indicated when it let those exemptions lapse uh, that it would begin, it would, it would review whether or not it made sense to include treasuries and reserves in that leverage calculation. I'm sure that analysis is ongoing, but I think that's certainly some, something worth serious study. What is the rationale actually for the SLR? I don't, not sure I understand it because I would think the treasuries are as close to risk-free as possible. You know, it, the history of this is before the GFC, David, we had risk-based uh, uh, standards for banks. And so treasuries are not risky. Other bonds are more risky. There was a sense broadly in the global community, not just in the U.S., but, you know, through the Basel process in, in Europe and Asia, central bank and policymakers agreed that it made sense to have a supplementary leverage ratio that typically would not be binding most of the time, but it could prevent, if you will, financial institutions from gaming an entirely risk-based system. However, you know, we discovered in March of 2020, the banks were in great shape. The banks were part of the solution, not part of the problem. And there can be perverse consequences of having a supplementary leverage ratio, especially when the central banks are doing large amounts of, of QE, because they're creating reserves, which the system has to absorb. So I think it's certainly something the Fed could uh, address, and I think it could make a lot of sense. Rich, thank you so much for being on Wall Street Week. I hope you'll come back often. It's really good to have you. Yeah. It's Richard Clarida of PIMCO. Coming up, we're going to wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Welcome back now, our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard, to wrap up the week for us. Larry, thank you so much for being back with us. A lot of us spent a lot of the week, actually, trying to figure out where the Fed is headed, particularly where the terminal rate is. And we got conflicting, I think at least, somewhat conflicting answers out of the Fed, including with Mr. Bullard, the Fed president, saying, well, five, five and a quarter, and then put up a chart using the Taylor rule that suggested seven. Where are we? Look, no one knows. Uh, I think it's a mistake to be slavish about uh, Taylor rules. Uh, the market thinks the number's going to be about five. I look at things, and my sense is there's more room for that to be too low. 
than there is for that to be too high. But it's pretty clear that we've had the big moves on uh, this cycle, and now we're going to be finishing that process uh, off. My view is that there's more risk from stopping prematurely and not really uh, curing inflation and setting the stage up for a reacceleration of inflation after it comes down. I see that as a bigger risk than going too far, because going too far would mean bringing inflation down below 2 percent. And that still seems to me like an awfully remote risk uh, starting from where we are. But I think that the Fed has this in the right place when it says that they're going to move up uh, somewhat more and they're going to take stock of the situation and see what the inflation data is saying and seeing what the inflation forecasts are saying when we get to next uh, get to the spring of next fall spring winter rather spring of uh, next year. I have to say that if they hadn't made as many mistakes as they did of excessive optimism about inflation, they'd probably have a little more room than they do uh, to rely on forecasts that hadn't yet proved out that inflation was going to come down. Larry, you and I talk a lot about monetary policy, even fiscal stimulus and things, but geopolitics have also fa factored increasingly in some of the issues having to do with the economy. This week we had what is potentially, we don't know if it is, an important development in the, the meeting of President Xi of China and President Biden. What do you make of those discussions and even ongoing discussions, because now we have the USTR, uh, Madam Tai, actually meeting with her counterpart. Uh, what do you make of the situation with China right now in the United States? Look, as uh, Churchill famously said, jaw-jaw uh, jaw is a lot better than bang-bang. And so the fact that they had a meaningful conversation that lasted more than three hours, the fact that they both came out of the conversation with a sense that there had been satisfying dialogue, the sense that there are some follow-on uh, steps, I think that's all to the uh, good. What it's really going to mean, what really is going to happen, is there going to be constructive movement out of those dialogues? I think that's something we're going to have to wait and see. But I'm encouraged uh, by, uh, but I, by what I saw, and I think it means that President Biden's whole trip has to be regarded as a success. The United States back in the game with respect to climate in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, the meeting with uh, Xi. I don't think this G20 will be long remembered, but at a very vexing moment, there could have been some kind of breakdown. And there certainly was not that. Well, as a, as a minimal thing, I've read some places people say at least there is a G20. I mean, they came out with a joint communique, and it was fairly tough on Russia, I think it's fair to say. And the reporting behind the scenes are is that some of the developing countries, like Indonesia uh, and India, helped drive that process, which might, uh, might I don't want to overread it, suggest that maybe we're taking a half step back toward multilateralism. I think things I think uh, I think we are. I think uh, that what Russia has done has really shocked the conscience of uh, the world and has affected very, very many uh, countries. Um, we'll have to see how this plays out. I think we need to remain aware that in the original vote in the UN General Assembly, there were countries with more than half of the world's population who abstained onto Russia's side, who declined to join in uh, condemning uh, Russia. So I think we've got a lot of work to do, and we in the United States uh, tend to be a bit over-optimistic about the extent to which all others see us as the, in the benign way that we see ourselves.
It's such an important point, and it takes me back at least to China, because it seems to me that sometimes we've been overly optimistic. I mean, for example, going back to the time we admitted to the WTO, we thought China was going to become more like us. And then we go over to the other extreme of being perhaps overly pessimistic about China. I guess my question for you is former Treasury Secretary, among other things, how do we play both sides of that? We don't know how we'll end up. How do we keep open the realistic possibility we can really work closely with China, but also protect ourselves against the possibility of confrontation? We in the United States probably need to be careful about our evangelizing influence. I don't think it's really for us to tell China how they should organize their entire society. I think it's for us to stand up for some of our fundamental interests in security and fair economic competition, but uh, to leave it um, at uh, that point. I think we're going to need to be very careful with respect to our diplomacy on the issue of Taiwan. I think we need to be very careful about, about giving China the sense that we are trying to change the traditional uh, one China uh, policy, because I think that could risk uh, disastrous uh, conflict. So I think the operative words for us need to be respect for them, respect for the positions and the fundamental interests that they have, and at the same time, absolute insistence on our own. And I would say one other thing, uh, David. I think, ultimately, we will prevail in this broad contest with uh, China. But I think if and when we prevail, it is going to be more than anything else on the strength of our example. And that's why domestic renewal at home, whether the issue is scientific innovation or infrastructure, whether the issue is doing something about opiate, opiate deaths, or whether the issue is strengthening our education uh, system, whether the issue is building on the greatness of uh, our universities or the greatness of our national parks. I think, ultimately, it's going to be our ability to remain the country that's the envy of the world, the country to which people want to come, that is going to determine our success. And if we change our focus from building ourselves up mm -hmm. to tearing China down, I think we will be making a very risky and very unfortunate choice. Larry, I want to make a very large turn here. I've had the benefit of talking to you about the Masters, about basketball, all sorts of things. I want to talk to you about Taylor Swift. She's a rather popular pop music star and Ticketmaster, because we now know the Department of Justice is investigating possible antitrust problems there because of Ticketmaster, which does, after all, have like a 70 percent market share. It's been under investigation for some time. I don't know if you know much about Tyler Swift, although I am concerned about you getting tickets, which apparently seems to be difficult. But, uh, but more broadly, what does it say, perhaps, about some of the problems with over-concentration in the economy? You know, I want to say two things about that, uh, David. The first is that if the government made a website that functioned as badly as Ticketmasters has here, everybody would be laughing and scorning uh, the government. And so the next time the private sector says that, you know, the public sector can't do anything uh, right, this was a private sector building a website. Sort of like they have to build a website for Obamacare, <laughs> right. sort of like they have to build websites at the IRS, yeah, sort yeah. of like they have to build, yeah. uh, build websites uh, for student loan uh, right. debt relief. And the private sector utterly failed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that we just have to remember the next time somebody wants to say everything about government is hopeless. Yeah, we are, we are Look, humble. Look, on antitrust. Have, yeah, we, Larry, we're going to have to leave it there. I'm so sorry. We're humble. We have much to be humble about. Larry, thank you so very much. That's Larry Summers, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. Coming up, a lot of people get hurt when there's a collapse like that of FTX, but who stands to benefit? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. If Tom Brady's for it,
It's got to be good, right? I'm getting into crypto. With FTX. You in? Despite that endorsement from the greatest quarterback of all time, the collapse of Sam Bankman Fried's FTX has brought heartbreak to a lot of people, wiping out in one fell swoop what was estimated to be a $32 billion empire, leaving what its lawyers now say could be as many as a million creditors holding the bag. And, by the way, triggering a class action lawsuit against Tom Brady and others paid to tout FTX to the world. The ripple effects of the collapse of FTX and the rest of Sam Bankman Freed's empire now beginning here as we wait for bankruptcy proceedings. All of which has shaken the confidence of many investors. That's according to Citadel's Ken Griffin. FTX is, is one of these absolute travesties in the history of financial markets. People are going to lose billions of dollars. And that undermines trust in all financial markets. But as bad as the FTX collapse may be, it's only the latest in a series of major meltdowns we've seen in recent years. Just think back to 2001, when that mythical energy giant Enron hit the skids. Its former CEO, Jeff Skilling, reflected back on the loss in his later testimony before Congress. I am devastated by and apologetic about what Enron has come to represent. No words can make things right. Too many people have been hurt too much. Or WorldCom, the telecommunications phenom of the late 90s that followed Enron into bankruptcy in 2002, wiping out a market cap of $186 billion and sending its former CEO, Bernie Ebers, to prison, despite his trying to seek protection behind the Fifth Amendment. I've been instructed by my counsel not to testify based on my Fifth Amendment constitutional rights. Or that emblem of the first internet bubble, Pets.com, with that cute sock puppet mascot, which was an instant market hit when it went public, and just as quickly went flop. What goes up must come down. All of these notorious failures shared a bold vision, a confident leader, and a belief that they'd come up with a better mousetrap, just like Mr. Bankman Freed. And if FTX follows the pattern, it will share one other thing with colossal failures through the years. A lot of lawyers making a lot of money despite all the carnage. When Enron went into bankruptcy, it had assets of over $65 billion. In the ultimate resolution, shareholders were wiped out at a loss of $74 billion. But the lawyers, they walked away with over $1 billion along with the accountants. WorldCom was three times as big, losing investors an estimated $175 billion, while the lawyers were making over $10 million a month in a proceeding that lasted well over a year. Lehman was forced into bankruptcy amid one of the most turbulent periods in our economic history, which culminated in a catastrophic crisis of confidence and a run on the bank. But those were all small potatoes compared with Lehman, a bankruptcy that wiped out between $46 billion and $63 billion, according to the New York Fed, and netted the lawyers and other consultants a cool, get this, $6 billion. So we'll see how much the FTX creditors end up writing off, much less the token holders. As much pain as they're feeling, though, you can be sure that there's one group that will come out okay. It's always the lawyers. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.